And the uh, reason why I think this is so important is that once we leave this world and uh, we stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, that's when it's going to be determined what you have uh, for eternity as far as rewards go. We're not talking about something, you know, well, you know, it's just a, a short period of time or it's not just a thousand years. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, these things lasting uh, forever. He even talks about those that take care of the poor. He said, it says, their righteousness remaineth forever. In other words, whatever is, whatever righteous, there's personal righteousness that w we as Christians should have. And that personal righteousness, those personal good deeds, when God rewards us, those, that, whatever that is that he rewards us with, it's just not temporal. It's not a, it's not a plastic trophy that, you know, gets broken and gets thrown in the trash. It's something that lasts forever. And uh, we should all be striving for a full reward, but I'm going to give you some, some ways to lose it. If you're looking to lose it, uh, it seems like there are a lot of Christians bent on losing their reward if they have one. So let's have a, let's, well, turn to 2 Timothy 2.5. Get ahead of myself here. 2 Timothy 2.5. <clears throat> the title of the message is Losing a Full Reward. 2 Timothy 2.5, if a man also strive for masteries, that means he's going to strive to be uh, good at what he does or the best at what he does. Yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. In other words, God wants it done a certain way. He doesn't want it done your way. He wants it done his way. He is the one rewarding. He wants it done his way. And uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, of the brethren out there that believe in doing it their own way. And they're not striving lawfully. Um, you might get them one. I can, I can mention a few preachers that uh, compromise. One in particular I'll mention is Billy Graham. Uh, did it work? Man, he won a bunch of them. But it's only temporary. And by the way, God didn't say you couldn't win them. He just said you're not going to be rewarded for it because you didn't strive lawfully. You're not going to be crowned. That crown of rejoicing is, is, is what you're looking for when you're winning souls to Jesus Christ. But he, he told him, he said, you can do that, but I'm not going to reward you. And when you do that, there's a reason God doesn't want you to do it that way. Look at the mess we're in now. Now we can't win any of them, hardly. I mean, we're just winning just bits and... I mean, it used to be we're winning them by the multitude. Now we're just winning them a little bit here and there, one at a time. One over here, one over here. We've got to send people around the world to win a few souls over, uh, you know, around the world. And there's a reason for that. It's because the church compromised some things and... Um, because we thought, you know, well, we can do it this way and get a lot more people to come in, but we have to compromise. And that's what they did. All right, so let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless this uh, message. Help us, Lord, to have a full reward. Uh, uh, that is so important that we realize how important this is for us right now and that we are active in serving you and active in doing right by you. And Lord, help me to get this message out. Help me to help them understand the, the things that could be done that would cause them to lose it and that they not be a party to it. And Lord, I pray that you bless now. Uh, thank you for those that are here. Uh, just pray that you'd bless everything that's going on this afternoon. A lot going on today, Father. I just pray that your hand be in it. And we just ask you to bless now this service for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right. <clears throat> First point is do not compromise the book or Bible doctrine to get along. Okay. This goes against modern church etiquette. And that is, you know, don't bring up doctrine. Don't, don't, don't upset people. Just doctrine's not that important. Doctrine is very important. <laughs> if you look up the word, um, now I can't think of it. Huh? Unity. Thank you. If you look up the word unity in the Bible, it's found three times. Three times. You know how often we preach about unity? You know how often every, the, every pastor, and probably in, in 100 miles from here, has probably got a message on unity this morning, probably 80% of them. Three times found in the Bible. The word doctrine is found 50 times just in the New Testament. Which you think is more important to God? In fact, when he talks about unity, he talks about two brothers walking together in agreement with one another. Can two walk together except they be agreed? It's interesting, isn't it? How God looks at things and how we look at it. 
And you'll find churches that will compromise doctrine. They, they won't preach on the second coming. They won't preach on hell. They won't preach on a lot of different things. Why? Mm, might dampen the giving. Might, uh, the plate might not come back as full. Uh, we might have somebody to disagree with it. Jesus don't care. If they disagree with it or not, you don't comp... Because you, know, you realize what you're doing, right? You're compromising God. You're selling him out because you want to build a big church or you want, you want a big offering or you want to be accepted. You want to be looked up. You don't want to be ridiculed. You don't want to be uh, criticized. That's what's going on. Don't compromise. Look at 2 John. Little book of 2 John, one chapter. Look at verse 8 to 11. Look what he says there. He says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought. That means you work for it. But that we receive a full reward. So evidently, here's something you can do to lose it. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Well, the doctrine of Christ includes not only his deity, but his first and second coming. It says, If there come any unto you, bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. <laughs> Don't say God bless you to a Jehovah's Witness or to a Mormon. Don't wish him Godspeed. Just say, See you, bub. Later on, something like that. <laughs> don't, whatever you do, don't ask God to bless them. Why would you ask God to bless a heretic? You wouldn't. He talks about not even receiving them into your house. I don't, I don't waste my time with them. I wasted so much time with them before. You come to the house, you know, and you try to convince them. You think you can. Most of the time, you cannot. Um, but I give it a try. And I got somewhere one time, you know, I had a young couple. And they came to the door. They were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I had a board inside there trying to start a church in the house. Called it Exodus Baptist Church. It didn't work. Anyway, I, was, uh, I took this board, man. I'm just showing all these different scriptures, you know, and proving the deity of Christ. And I could tell, man, the girl, she was just, she was questioning. And he would just keep shushing her, you know, and because she was like, is that right? Yeah. And he's like, so what happened was they went back to the... Uh, went back to the kingdom hall and one of the elders straightened them out with a Greek. That's, that's how they do it. You can't straighten out a King James Bible without straightening it out with Greek if you want to change it. Because the King James Bible is going to tell you the truth and they use a King James. At least they did at the time. So the next thing you know, I get a knock on the door and it's not the young couple, it's two elders. So, and you ain't going to convince them of nothing. Anyway, and he says, he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. I certainly didn't say, God bless you. <laughs> I didn't tell him that. Uh, this mis that kind of misconduct can cause you to lose uh, what you have worked for. And that's you're willing to compromise what God said to get along. Never do that. Never do that. If people hate you for that, they hated him, didn't they? Didn't he say they hated me before they hated you? Why would that surprise you? You know, the whole world, you know, the, the world thinks we're, first of all, they think we're crazy, okay, for even believing it. But they think we're, we're, we're uh, uh, xenophobes, that, which I don't know how they get that, but they think we're homophobes, they think we're, uh, uh, we're against everybody, we're against everything, we don't believe in anybody enjoying themselves, you know. They get that in their mind. But what it is, they're against what God says about those things. Because God put, God put limits on people. He says, I don't, I don't want you to do this, and you can do this, but you can't do this. They hate that. I mean, we don't, we don't care for it that much either, but we, we, God said it, therefore we, we listen to it. But you can't walk hand in hand with them and, and compromise with them. Now, I'm not saying you've got to bring up everything every time you're around somebody. But when the, when, the, uh, you know, when the rubber meets the road and it comes to that doctrine or we're not friends, it's been nice knowing you. I'm not going to compromise God out. Who's my best friend? Huh? Isn't it Jesus? 
a, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother? So why am I selling him out for you? It's kind of stupid, isn't it? I just tell you, say, well, you know, I just agree with what Jesus says. I just believe what he says. If he says it, then it's so. If he says he's coming back, it's coming back. If he says there's a lake of fire, or there's a hell fire, then there's hell fire. That's just the way it is. And folks can't handle that. So don't walk hand in hand with heretics uh, in your work for God. Do not bless them or support them in any way. Do not compromise Bible doctrine to get along or allow a false Bible. Okay? Now, somebody might come in here with a, a different Bible than a King James Bible. And you'll never have a word said to you. But you'll know from the pulpit sooner or later that, oh, there's something wrong with what I've got. And we can prove it, that there's something wrong with what you've got if it's not a King James Bible. It's not like I'm not going to prove it to you. I can prove it to you. Um, because God only wrote one book and, uh, uh, for the English-speaking people. And let me tell you something. That book, every, every one of them is different to the tune of about 30,000 changes. And I'm not going to compromise out the book just to get along with anybody. That's why when you, stay, when you say that you believe the King James Bible, you're a Bible-believing church, about 90% of the churches out there, maybe 95, write you off as crazy. Or, oh, King James onlyism, like it's a cult to believe what God said. Think about it. Think about it. They're, they're getting on you because you believe every word. Isn't it kind of strange? I thought we were supposed to believe every word. They don't. Not one of them can hand you a Bible and say that's the Word of God from cover to cover. Not one of them. They have never in their life, by their own profession, ever had in their hand the complete Word of God from cover to cover. They can't tell you what's God's Word and what's not. Certainly I can find a, a version of, of the Bible that's changed about everything in here. Who's got the problem here with faith? Not me. I'm not changing anything. It's them. Do not bow to false science. That's these crazy things that have no proof to it. There's no mathematics. There's no, there's no, it's just them guessing. It's like evolution. They're guessing. They don't have the proof. They have these things in their mind that they conjure up, but it's not proof. Listen, I'll tell you what. You can look, you can look at something. I can stare out in the field, and I say, man, I, I think I see a black bear out there. It looks just like a black bear. From this distance, I think it is a black bear. And then go out there to be a stump. Huh? You ever done that? I've been out there looking out in the woods thinking something's staring back at me, and I'm like, yeah. thinking, uh, I'm going to try to sneak up on it, and it's a branch. It didn't look like a snout of, a, you know, some wolf or something, or coyote, or whatever it was. And I'm thinking, it's stalking me, you know. Just because it appears that way don't mean it is that way. God's like that, man. He'll, you want to be careful. But don't bow to false science, philosophy, tradition, contrary to the Word of God. If it's contrary to this book, then it's not true. Whatever tradition that it's talked about, if it's contrary to this Bible, then it's not tradition you should follow. Don't compromise out the book. Don't compromise out God. Uh, the second thing is do not compare yourself with others. You'll do less than your best. And, you know, I'll tell you who we compare ourselves to. Uh, lesser brethren. You know, I compare myself to the backslidden that are at home, not at church. I look pretty good <laughs> since I'm here at church. But compare yourself to somebody that's on fire for God and really doing a work. You're like, well, I don't know. I don't think he's all that sincere. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the problem. I believe in following men. I do. There are certain men that I have followed. Okay. I follow Brother Estep. I follow Dr. Ruckman. I follow these men. Okay. I never tried to compare myself, or at least let's put it this way. God convinced me not to compare myself to them. And I'll tell you the reason why, especially Dr. Ruckman. Dr. Ruckman, he was so busy, and he had so many things going on. He could do so many things. It's unbelievable, really. He lived about three lifetimes. I'm not kidding you. In a month's time, that man probably did more than I did in two years. I'm just being honest with you. And I'm not exaggerating either, man. I mean, we talk about what he was able to do and, and the evangelism, the books that he wrote, the paintings that he painted, the baptistries that, baptistries that he painted. Uh, you had the Sunday school. You had the radio program. You had the TV program. You had the street preaching. 
You had the chalk talks everywhere. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to compare myself to him. I quit. I might as well just, where's the resignation? Where do I sign, man? He goes, well, you're not being like Dr. Ruckman. I'm never going to be like Dr. Ruckman. I'm never going to be like E-Step. And don't compare yourself like that because either you'll do one of two things, you'll, which you won't do. You won't compare yourself to somebody greater than you. You'll compare yourself to somebody less than you. Then you'll do less than your best. That's what you'll do. So look at so-and-so over there. He ain't doing nothing. At least I'm doing something. Man, that's not, that's not who you... <laughs> at least but if you, you know, you say, what's the answer? Well, the answer is looking unto Jesus. That's the answer. There's who you want to compare yourself with. Uh, and he says this, I meant to get to the verse here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. So you got that crowd too. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You might be comparing yourself to a bad apple. You might be comparing yourself to someone that's got the talk but not the walk. You've got to be careful about all that. It says, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God had distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. In other words, Paul had a line that God gave him. He said, this is your line. You know, what's my line? This is your line. It's not your line. It's his line. Why are you boasting about that line when it's not yours? Every church has their line. Every man that, that God calls to something has a certain line of, of what God wants him to do. So you can't compare yourself to lines, man, because some of them are, may not be that unfruitful, but they still take labor. And God's still going to reward that labor. Rest home ministry is not, I mean, you're not winning them by the thousands in the rest home. But bless God, they need the gospel since it's the last stop. You know what I mean? So we take it to them. But I wouldn't want to compare that to the jail ministry where we win, we've won hundreds and hundreds. A little bit different situation. We'll take both. We'll do both. But that doesn't mean your labor there is going to be less than what is done at the jail. He said your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Period. So don't think about have to, that we have to be as fruitful as somebody else. If we're doing the work, we get rewarded for it. Just don't compare yourself to everything. That drives me crazy, man. I mean, it, it, and Baptists are the worst at it. You've got to compare yourself to everybody. Compare yourself to this standard and that standard. How long you just ask God what, what kind of standards he wants you to have and then live it? You know, I think he can tell you. Last I heard, he could talk. He could speak to you about what he wants you to do. I just asked God, I said, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. It says, for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we preach not unto you, if we have come uh, as far to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. He said, we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. Okay? I can't do that anyway. I can't do anything God didn't give me the power to do. I don't, have the, I don't have the ability. I'm one of those guys that has whatever God gave me, that's it. There's nothing that's a part of me that can fulfill what he wants me to do. I don't have it. I mean, I wish I did. I mean, if you can do Barnum and Bailey, man, you can win them. If you've got that silver tongue where you can just, you know, talk, 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 talk. And I know I've gotten like that, but I didn't start out like that. Um, he said, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. That's staying in your line and doing what God wants you to do and not boasting about somebody else, what they've accomplished, like you did it. Because you didn't. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our mind. So, <clears throat> don't compare yourself. I wouldn't even, if I was you, I wouldn't even compare churches. I don't know why you would. They're all different. I mean, I can show you some churches, you know, they fire you up. They got very little content and they don't teach you much Bible. They can fire you up, though. The offering box will be just overflowing. Missions, you know. 
But God says you've got to edify the body too. There's part of that. It's just a different thing there. So don't, don't get into a habit of, of comparing, well, we've got to be like this. Well, he told you not to. I mean, you can follow another Christian. You can even emulate some of their good deeds, but don't compare yourself. Because you'll get discouraged. Because you can't do what they can do, or you'll get complacent because you're actually better than them. Which is not saying much. You've probably picked the lowest guy on the, on the totem pole. <clears throat> like I said, Hebrews 12, too. He's the measure, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's who you want to keep your eye on. I just ask God now, what do you want done? I'll do it. Where you want us to go, we'll go. Open up an avenue, open up something, we'll do it. Close down something, we'll close it. Open and shutting of doors. God can do what he wants. We just have to be open to it. <clears throat> you know, he said in John chapter 5, verse 44 to 47, he said, How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Doesn't the Bible say it's not whom you commit, it's whom God commendeth? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what you want. You want God's commendation, not somebody else's. Some people live for that pat on the back from everybody else. Now, I'm not against giving somebody a pat on the back, but I'm not, I'm not waiting on your pat on the back. I'm waiting on his. I appreciate it when you come up. That was a really good message, preacher. That's encouraging to me. But I'm going to come up with a message next week whether you encourage me or not. Why? I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you've got to keep that in mind. All right, I'll move on here. Uh, do not forget to live by faith. He said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's a reward involved. What? You've got to believe God. And I can tell you this, that God is going to ask you to do things that you can't see the end of it. You, can't, you cannot possibly know how it's going to turn out. You can't know the troubles and, the, and the, the, uh, the little bumps in the way. Sometimes they're mountains. You can't see it. He will not let you see the end of that thing. He will make you trust him every step of the way. And I'm telling you, he'll, put, he'll give you adverse conditions. He'll give you financial strain. He'll put you in a place where you have to either trust him or you'll break from him. And you'll seek the world to handle your problems. That is the way your God is. He's going to check your oil, and he's going to test it every so often. I mean, really, it's a test every day, what you're willing to trust him for. And I'm telling you, man, the way he does it, it's like, Lord, you couldn't have stacked this deck against me like this unless it was you. I mean, when you see it like that, just know that it's God. Just know that it's him. Say, okay, I'll trust you with it. And let it go. You say, why? Then nothing you can do about it anyway. If it's so stacked against you, what can you do? Fret and worry and get an ulcer? If you see it that way, it is your God that has stacked that deck, and he's wanting to see what you'll do. Trust me now? Believe me now? Do you hear me now? God always wants to know that. He always wants to know if you're the first thing in his heart, in your heart. He always wants to know that. And he will bring those things in your life over and over again. The thing to do is, is recognize that it's him. And live by faith. I mean, we all think we, when we can see something, we can see the end of it, we can see the, the prize at the end. You never get to see it with God. Why? He wants you to live by faith. Why? It pleases him. Because now you're not just, I see it, therefore I'm going to reach for it. You say, I can't see it, but I'm still going to reach for it. Why? Because he told me to. And you believe him. When he says he'll never leave you, nor forsake you, you'll find times, man, you'll think, I'm forsaken! <laughs> you know? But you're not. I don't care how it looks. I don't care how it feels. care what the circumstances are. He just said he'll never leave you, then you don't forsake me. Man, you sure will feel like it sometimes. I go back to... Uh, COVID in the hospital with all these alarms going off 
and people busy. My wife's upstairs uh, uh, in full oxygen. They got me on oxygen and all this commotion going on and the fog of everything. And I said, I know you're here. I know you're here. You got to believe him. And whatever falls out that point, if it seemeth good to him, why are you complaining? If it seemeth good to him, then it should be that way. But you don't know till you ask. I do believe in prayer. If I can change the Lord's mind about something, I'll certainly give it a try. But you don't forget to live by faith. Do not lose your testimony. Beside your Bible, it's the most valuable thing you have. And the reason I say that is, if you expect any reward at the end, you're going to have to have a testimony to gain the fruit down here. Because if nobody believes you, I mean, if your life is such a disaster that nobody can see Christ in you, nobody's going nobody's to respond to you. Uh, you're not going to have any effect. He said there in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, he's talking about the second coming, but he says, uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's those that just reject. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. And in parentheses it says, because our testimony among you was believed. They've got to believe you. They have to see Christ in you. They have to see something different. That's why people get saved. They see something different. Wherefore also we pray uh, always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and work with uh, the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, for folks to believe, your testimony has to be believed. It's not just, and this is one thing, uh, trying, to get, trying to get this over to younger Christians, it's not just the procla proclamation of truth, but a proclamation of a life committed to that truth. That's what they see. It'd be like, it'd be like folks coming here to church and then when we, when we finally, uh, uh, okay, we're going to, that's it, you know, let's uh, depart and all this, do the final prayer. Everybody rushes outside and we're all out there smoking cigarettes. They'll walk right to their car, get in their car and drive off, and they'll say, well, they know different than I am. Or they see you at the local bar, you know, hey, I saw you at church Sunday. <laughs> you think that testimony is going to win them? You're no different than them. That's what they think. You have to have testimony. Um, the other thing is, do, don't pass up, don't lose your testimony. That's what I meant to say. The other one is, do not pass up opportunities to witness for Christ. Uh, Jesus saith unto them in John chapter 4, verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the, his work. Say not ye that there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth, wa uh, he that reapeth receiveth wages. When you reap the field that God's working in, and you go to work in that field for him, uh, you're going to reap wages. It says, and gather fruit unto life eternal, um, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So you don't know, you're not always the one that gets to reap the result. One soweth, one watereth, God giveth the increase. And herein is that saying, uh, saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap <clears throat> what thereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans, there they are, 
of that city believed it on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Too bad the disciples kind of didn't get in on that labor, did they? But that Samaritan woman did. He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're full of fruit, ready to be reaped. we got a whole world full of lost people that need to be saved. Whole world. Millions, billions. Don't pass up an opportunity because it would be uncomfortable. I've always said this, and I, I, I know this because of me, that most Christians don't win people to Christ because they won't draw the net. They'll get right up to it, and then they'll balk. Because it's, it's one thing to give them the gospel, and you're kind of telling them everything, and for God so love the Lord, give them John 3, 16. You're going through all the... And then instead of saying, would you pray with me and ask the Lord to save you, I'd be glad to help you pray that prayer. You cease. And you let them walk off. You didn't draw the net. You got to give them an opportunity. Would you like to be saved today? I can help you. You know, doesn't take much time. Just take a few minutes, but I can show you. I can show you the verses. I can show you what to pray and what to what you have to believe. Don't pass up that opportunity. You'll know. I'm not saying everybody you come up to. Sometimes you know you, you get one. I get uh, ten words with them. Hand them a gospel track. I'm not going to say, hey, hand them a gospel track for the pray. You know, I probably wouldn't do that. But if I've got somebody and God created the situation where I can witness to them and they're right there ready, draw the net. Take the opportunity. What's the worst that can happen? They say, no, not at this time. Sometimes they will. They say, well, I, I really don't want to do anything like that now. I said, well, I didn't say, well, would you go home and do it? Will you remember to do it? Tonight before you go to bed, would you just get on your knees and ask the Lord to be your Savior? Would you do that? Do you believe you need to do that? Yeah, okay, would you do that? I mean, press them just a little. I mean, we don't, we don't have to have 20 verses of, you know, just as I am. <laughs> One more time. I mean, I've, I've gone forward to get saved because I got tired of hearing the song, you know. I'm just, for the third time, you know. Wear you out, man. I mean, they try to wear you down, you know. And I'm not against all that. There's some folks that maybe it works for them. I don't know. Um, and something not about reaping is about being the sower or the waterer. All right, <clears throat> here's one. Do not forget to take up your cross, or you'll not get your crown. He said, Luke 9:23. And he said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Ooh, ooh, that really doesn't fit today, does it? And take up his cross daily and follow me. You know, Jesus took up a cross, didn't he? Was it his or yours? He's kind of taking up your cross, wasn't he? Guess what happens in the ministry? Guess what happens as a Christian? You get to take up somebody else's. The cross you bear is probably not yours. It's somebody else's. <laughs> like somebody took up yours. You're bearing something. Um... But first, you've got to deny yourself because we're so selfish. We wouldn't do anything for anybody like that, would we? You've got to deny yourself. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Follow what Jesus would. What would Jesus do? WWJD. <laughs> but what would he do? I mean, he's talking about the Good Samaritan. Would you be that Good Samaritan? If he is telling you about, uh, you know, you're around people lost all the time, and some, you know, here, here's what happens. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying you got a cold start something, you know, and just because you ran into them and you're walking by them, you say, hey, 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 i got to tell you something. <laughs> you might get punched. Um, I'm talking about the ones that God brings to you where you know you're supposed to be saying something. And you're not doing it. Or you're just doing it part way and just kind of leaving it because it's uncomfortable. I know it's uncomfortable. When somebody witnessed to you, it was uncomfortable. But then you got saved, right? Sometimes you just have to do it. Sometimes you just say, okay, Lord, give me the opportunity and I'll do it. And then go with it. You say, well, I'll stumble around and I'll be mumbling. I say, Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I, I, I've, I've, had, I've had a witness where I thought, I don't even understand what I explained. And I've had him get saved. 
Because God just said, that's okay, I'll interpret it for you. Because it is, it's, it's a little bit stressful. You're talking about life and death, heaven and hell. And you're probably talking to a friend or a relative, and you don't want to lose them as a friend or a relative. So, that's it. Um, <clears throat> don't think for a moment, if you're going to have a testimony, you're going to follow Jesus Christ, that you're not going to have a burden to bear. Because you will. You will. All right, last one. Do not faint or become weary in well-doing. This is going to be good for Laodicea because I can tell you, man, uh, you almost want to quit. You look at the world and you look at the mess and you look at the church and it's like, I can't deal with it. I'm just going to quit. But you can't quit. God didn't tell you to quit. God didn't tell you, God didn't tell you what kind of results you're going to have because it doesn't matter. If he's the one that gives the increase, you just carry on regardless of whether you have results or not. You don't quit because he didn't tell you to quit. He said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are the household of faith. Not only are you willing to go out there to the lost, but you want to take care of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Do whatever you can for folks. That's good in, in God's sight. It's, a, it's, it's something that he'll reward. Remember, doing right, you don't ever get a reward for just doing right. Because you're supposed to do right. <laughs> right? It's when you do something that's beyond that. You don't have to help anybody. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing right about it either, but there's nothing wrong with it. But it's when you do something else and you put a burden on yourself when you take uh, sacrifice time for yourself or, so or something else that's a sacrifice for you or from you, God's pleased with that. I'm talking about for a Christian. I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about for a Christian. But the greatest temptation of it all is to get weary and quit. <clears throat> but God rewards faithful Christians, not quitters. He says, we'll be rewarded if we Faint not. That's the key. Keep doing for God what you would have always done and ignore the circumstances. Just keep going. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to be steady Eddie. Just stay at it. Week after week, I don't try to go beyond a week. If I think beyond a week, I quit. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> Why? Because I see nothing but disaster. I see the, the stack or the deck stacked against me. But God's got the deck. So on we go. He can shuffle it any way he wants. But he tells me, he says, look, I'm with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in it. If you have faith toward me, and however this thing, I know how this thing's going to turn out. We know it's going to turn out. Is it going to get better? Is this going to get better? No. Is it going to get worse? Yes. It says it'll wax worse. I am worse. So I've, 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 I've settled it in my heart that it probably won't get better. I'm not looking for a mega church. Don't think we're going to get it. If we hit 50, I'm considering that mega. We're going to put on a church, mega church, Philadelphia Baptist Church. Because 50, I mean, we got close, man. We got so close one year, close to 50. I'm like, oh, the Lord must be coming back. <laughs> Set it on fire, that'll bring them. I know it'd bring me. You know when the praying hands were on? No, it wasn't the praying hands. It, it was the Jesus statue that got hit by lightning and burned. That was awesome, man. I'm like, yeah, Lord! Burn that idol! Anyway. You know there are three analogies in the Bible of, uh, for the Christian and, and how you're doing your service for God. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. Did you know that? What does a soldier do? You fight. What does an athlete do? You strive. And what does a farmer do? You work. No fighting for the soldiers, no victory. No striving for the athlete, no mastery. No work for the farmer, no crop. For the soldier, it takes courage. For the athlete, it takes discipline. And for the farmer, it takes faithfulness. You fight, compete, or produce. Those three things. 
You'll find that's what the Christian life is all about as far as after you're saved, walking with God, those three things. That's what he likens them to. <clears throat> all right. I was surprised I got done this early. This is three pages of notes, but we got through with it. Um, let's all stand. Thank you for coming this morning.